Hi, welcome to Free Daily Bread. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your word is an instruction manual, and it's just very few people use it for life instruction. So I'm just asking for, for the viewers to really listen and, and take this to heart. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in Proverbs 11, verse 14. Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. So in 14, we see, the, we see this now more than ever. People, nations fall that means they're wrecked when government has no wise counsel well hello counsel is one giving wise advice that's why we call people counselors today the world is like a ship lost at sea during a hurricane and the captain jumped ship God has given us government systems for structures of, uh, for wise authority. But when a nation leaves God, his judgment disciplines that nation. And how does he do that? We can learn from the Old Testament. He does that by giving them a weak leader with no good counsel. People hate, hated law in truth so god hands them over to what the majority wanted no law and no truth another way you know god's judgment is coming is when women and children are ruling over men look at isaiah three twelve. i didn't write the bible as for my people Children are their oppressors. Isn't that interesting? Look, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee, cause thee to err and destroy the way of the past. Who leads men and nations into ruin? Well, a lot of times it's children and women who are trying to lead men. Look how many disobedient children there are these days. Look at BLM, Antifa. Do you know how old these people are? They're young. They're young. They're like teenagers. They're children. And, and women ruling over men. Okay? Women were created to be helpers of men. Not to rule them. Okay? But to only help them. I didn't write the Bible. This is one of the reasons why nations crumble. <clears throat> Stay here. Look in 3-4. And I will give children to be their princes and babes shall rule over them. This is one of God's judgments. By, make, by bringing in children to oppress. And not only that, but they lead. Wow. That's interesting. <clears throat> Look around. Do you see how many children rule their parents? The majority. The majority of parents have no discipline, instruction, and correction for their children because they themselves live in, live in disobedience to God. So what happens is when the parent lives in disobedience to God, God will then give them a child that lives in disobedience to them to kind of give them a taste of their own medicine on how, on how God sees the parent. That's interesting. <clears throat> God's judgment comes when innocent blood, God's judgment also comes when innocent blood is shed and they oppress people for money. Look at Ezekiel 22, 22, 27. Her princes, when the Bible says princes, that just means world leaders. In the middle thereof are like wolves ravening. That word ravening, that means tearing to pieces. The prey, to shed blood. 
and to destroy souls for what? To get dishonest gain. Money. They will kill for money. Well, that's one of the reasons God's judgment came unto Israel because that's how they were living. Well, and you could even put this into uh, wolves behind the pulpits. They're not shedding literal blood, but spiritually they're destroying souls to get dishonest gain. You only have to know these vi these verses that we just read within these last five minutes, okay? To, to understand God's judgment is coming to the whole world. Not one country has wise leaders. No counselors. No counselors for the public good and safety. Go to any, any inner Democrat city and tell me if you see any safety. And why don't any nation have wise counsel these days? Well, because they all left the wonderful counselor. Look at Isaiah 9.6. Amazing prophecy of Jesus. For unto us a child is born. This is Jesus. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. He's going to come and rule. And his name shall be called. Here we go. Wonderful. Look. Capital C. Counselor. Okay. The mighty God. Show this to a Jehovah Witness that says Jesus is not God or anyone else who denies the Trinity. His name will be the mighty God. It'll, it'll also be what? The everlasting father. Isn't that interesting? Well, how is that? Well, it's the Trinity. His name will also be the Prince of Peace. Amen. Notice, Counselor, capital C. So the reason why people reject godly counsel is because if they take godly counsel, then they'll, then they'll be obedient to God. But since they're enemies to God, they take no counsel. Only by God's word is a nation right in right standing with counsel. Only if they use God's word. Look at Psalms 119. Psalms 119.24 Thy testimonies are also my delight and my counselors. There we go. What's a delight to God? His counselors. Who is his counselors? Those who are ambassadors of Christ, speaking on the king's behalf, giving wise counsel to friends and family and even strangers on how to have a relationship with God. Only the ungodly will reject a wise counsel. Okay. When you tell someone, for example, to, you know, to read the Bible, okay, which is very the most loving advice that you can give to anyone. Do you know how many people get offended when you tell them to read the Bible? These are people who reject good counsel. When leaders are ungodly, all right, Christians, here we go. How do we survive in these last days? When leaders are ungodly, Christians are to self-govern. We don't obey with anything that is against God's word. Also, as a Christian, you must seek advice from another Christian. Okay? Never take advice from an enemy of the cross. This is because they only care about one's feelings, not the truth. 15. He that is surety for a stranger shall smart for it, and he that hates 
sure it to ship is sure. Surety is debt, paying someone's debt. So in 15, to promise to pay the debts of a stranger is to invite trouble. Only the fool would be surety, pay one's debts for a stranger. For example, do you know how many support free college tuitions? Well, who's going to pay for that? It's not free. The bill will be handed to the citizens. This is called Marxism. This is when the middle class must help the poor. And then the middle class becomes poor themselves because they have to provide for people who refuse to be independent and work for their own education. Then what happens, the education that you're paying for, that college is going to brainwash the student to hate America and its history. If your child is not founded on the word of God before going to college, you're setting them up for failure. They have to be strong in their beliefs. That's where your money's going for free college tuitions, though. Most likely, they're going to be brainwashed if they're not founded on Christ. Look what's happening. They're calling for gen genocide of the Jews. Unbelievable. One who receives free anything from the government is not really an advantage. It's actually bondage. Understand. I'm not speaking against people relying on the government to, to give them their social security check or their retirement check or against people who just need a little help so they can advance in life. I'm speaking against people who could work, who can work, but their laziness wants to be supported by taxpayers. These are people who who switched the words of self-entitlement to oppression. Because oppression sounds better to the ones who never achieved any life goals. So what happens is they now blame their wasted life on other people. That's, that's, that's a mental illness. That's a mental illness. Mental illness is only just demonic oppression, okay? That's, the, yeah, they are oppressed by the devil. So, I know this is intense. I'm just speaking, I'm just speaking truth here. One who receives free anything from the government in a lazy way, okay, because they don't want to work. Like I said, it's not really an advantage, it's bondage. Because what will surely shortly happen is we can look to China, the social credit score. And what's happening right now in China, that's what's happening right now in China. If one disagrees with the leaders of China, that person gets marked on their social score, kind of like a credit score, okay? Then they can't go to school, they can't get a job, they can't ride the train or a bus or travel or get any government assistance at all because, because they don't agree with the government. Then they have to go to these camps for them to re rehabilitate their mind and, and brainwash and force them to agree with the government. And this is why it's not an advantage in a long-term sense to rely on free stuff. When these college kids, college kids are getting free tuitions, it's only to brainwash them. Now, 
there's nothing wrong with, like I said, using the government for, for a short time help, like I said, as a stepping stone. But to live off the government for, for survival because just out of laziness, then that's terrifying. It's kind of like this. There's a lion at the zoo. He's in a cage. He gets free health care. He gets free food. He doesn't have to hunt. Okay? Or anything like that. Then there's the free lion who is in the jungle. Okay? Okay? He hunts for his own food. He has to take care of his own health, but he's free. The other one is in bondage. Do you see what I'm saying here? That's like relying on the government when you can provide for yourself. You're actually in bondage. So the free lion is one who hates surety. Look, the smart person hates surety. It is responsible. He's responsible for himself only. Okay, his own debts and all things are under his control. The free person, stay with me now. The free person who is independent hates surety because they don't want to pay no one else's debt. They're already providing for themselves. Those are the ones who are secure. They are sure that's secure. It's quite ironic. The lion in the jungle is more secure and sure than the one in the cage. That's another form of brainwashing. The government has people all messed up. This is why so many will get the mark of the beast. It will be a forced way to provide for self. But one must admit, one must submit to the government first. How much you want to bet the mark of the beast will come with free digital money depending on your social score? The more you obey and bow to the beast, the more money you get. What I'm saying may sound crazy, but it's the future. As Christians, you don't need to worry about this if you're really the church because you will be raptured before all that happens. Amen. But for now, for people who get Social Security or retirement checks or they're on welfare, they can expect for some sort of, uh, for the government to force you into soon getting some sort of digital ID. That will more, like, more than likely happen. Um, it, it will be more than likely like uh, something in your phone, like a QR code. It's not the mark of the beast, but it's definitely a bridge to it. And again, understand the mark of the beast will not be enforced until midpoint tribulation and the church will be long gone by then. 16. A gracious woman retains honor and strong men retain riches. 16. In other words, a gracious woman earns honor. That means respect. But a strong, that means a ruthless man, gets and gives respect only from or for their riches, money. This woman, this gracious woman, has, has been saved by God's grace. Now she teaches holiness as a gracious woman. Understand the importance of the word grace because many don't understand what grace is. Grace, being gracious is not tolerance. Being gracious is one who is an example of being Christ-like and living holy and leading by example. <clears throat> most women refuse, most women will refuse God's grace, okay? Or they think it's a license to sin. They're very confused. So what they do is they get respect 
with their body. Their attractiveness is their only power. A gracious God-fearing woman doesn't normally get honor by this God-hating world. Okay? But she instead gets favor and honor by God. Amen. If a man has a gracious wife, then blessed is he because she is very rare. Look in, uh, stay here, look in 31.10. Who can find a virtuous, that means a, just a truly good woman, for her price is far above rubies. Well, if you have rubies that reach the heaven in your backyard, it's nothing compared to a godly woman if you're married to her. And, and if she has a God-fearing husband, what he should be doing is praising her along with their children. Stay here, look in verse 28, 31, 28. This is what happens when there is a godly woman and then she has a godly husband. This is what he does. Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Woe to the husband that doesn't praise his godly wife. They will have God to answer to why he didn't appreciate and honor the gift that God gave him. Stay here. Look in 1914. House and riches are the inheritance of, of fathers. That means from human activity. Anyways, here's my point. Look, and a prudent, that means a smart wife, look, is from the Lord. If you have a, God, if you have a godly wife, that's, that's, that's from God. That's a gift. Sadly, many gracious women are stuck with a ruthless, man who only cares about his money his hoarding okay their wealth is their god little g their stuff is their god little g it's interesting the word strong can mean ruthless in other interpretations in verse 16 Instead of strong men, some translations say a ruthless man. <clears throat> ruthless is cruel, merciless, and pitiless. Just as liquor is strong, so is the man intoxicated with the riches of this life. He feels respect is only for how much he has. These are the people that covet and hoard because they are jealous for what another has. So the more they have, <clears throat> the more intoxicated their pride gets. These men could care less about their gracious wife. They instead wish she was actually more like him, ruthless. That's so she won't give him the conviction that he's living like a child of the devil. Important to note, though, when you when you have mercy on someone, okay, that doesn't mean you are a doormat, okay? If insulted, the Christian... Okay, if one insulted a Christian, that person should apologize if they want a continued friendship. Okay, understand gracious. Being gracious is not tolerance and being a doormat. It's teaching people holy living. <clears throat> 17, let me take a drink. <clears throat> The merciful man, men, I'm sorry, the merciful man does good to his own soul, but he that is cruel troubles his own flesh. Let's get into this merciful word. Merciful is one who forgives, 
doesn't hold grudges and doesn't bring up the past. If you know someone who brings up the past and holds grudges, they're not a man of God. They have no mercy. God has mercy when we come to him with faith and he forgives us and throws our sin into the depths of the sea. Amen. To never be remembered or to never be brought up again. A man of God will have this same have these same qualities as he grows in Christ. <clears throat> God will reward how we lived. Okay? Look at 2 Samuel 22, 26. This is how God will treat us with the merciful that you will show that you will give others. Let me, let me, let me read the whole thing first. With the merciful, you will show thyself merciful. And with the upright man, you will show yourself upright. God will show himself merciful to the ones who are merciful. Okay. With the pure, you will show yourself pure. This means godly living. And with the froward, that means crooked, perverse. You will show yourself unsavory. You will be shrewd. You will be, your judgment will come on them. God responds to people as they deserve. Okay. Now understand. When you come to the cross, you are unworthy, okay? But after you leave the cross, you now have godly characteristics. You are now merciful and upright and pure. Amen. Look at Matthew 5, 7. Who is blessed? Well, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Those are the ones that are, that are going to get mercy. Merciful is compassionate and forgiving people. If one is not compassionate, they don't forgive, they hold grudges, they always bring up the past, and they're miserable, and they want everyone else to be miserable, it's because they have no mercy because they're not working with God's mercy. That's the truth. That's the truth. Look at 1 Peter 2.10. 1 Sorry. 1 Peter 2.10. I need to stop shaking my leg. It's moving the camera. Uh, 1 Peter 2.10. Which in time past. Oh, this is about being called out of darkness. Okay, chosen generation, called out of darkness to live holy. Which in time, but in time past, we're not a people. We were not godly people. But now, okay, we're the people of God, which had not obtained mercy. We didn't have mercy before. But look, but now we have obtained mercy. Amen. When you, oh, this is good. When you have God's mercy, that means you have God's grace. And when that happens, look, dearly beloved, I beg you as strangers and pilgrims, this is not our home. Earth is not our home. We're strangers and pilgrims. We're passing by. But when you have God's mercy, look what happens. You abstain from fleshly loss, which war against the soul. That's because we're walking in the spirit. If you're working with God's mercy, you're not, you're, you're saying no to temptation. Because your flesh is crucified on the cross. How do you know someone's not working with God's grace and mercy? They're going back to willful sin. They're still at war. They're still in a spiritual war. Look at Luke 6.36. Be therefore merciful as your father also is merciful. 
Well, there you go. Are you merciful? Well, praise God. You're being Christ-like. Are you not merciful? Well, then you're more like the devil. Okay? There's no in-between. <clears throat> Mercy is compassion. Compassion forgives. Those with no compassion, they won't forgive. They want to hold on to the past. This is because they never came to God with a true saving faith to receive God's mercy and compassion and forgiveness. So since they're not working with God's mercy, compassion, and forgiveness, they can't express that to other people because they don't have it themselves. That's intense. After God gives one undeserved mercy, the convert will give even enemies undeserved mercy. Back in Proverbs, that's the one. Why does this keep moving? There we go. That's the one in verse 17 who does good to his own soul. Does good to his own soul. The one that has compassion does good to his own soul. That's interesting. How do you know one with no mercy? Well, like I said, they are cruel and unforgiving. They are more closely related to their father, the devil, the great accuser. This person troubles his own flesh in 17. They have an internal conviction and because of that, he has no peace. And people who have no peace with the Prince of Peace, they don't want nobody else around them to have peace either. Misery loves misery. Their cruel behavior is boomeranged right back to them, though. <clears throat> so those with no mercy are self-righteous because they don't think they need God's mercy. So now they don't think they need to show mercy to no one else at all either. I don't need God's mercy and I don't need to show mercy. I am self-entitled. I am my own king sitting on the couch. Everybody serve me. Okay? That's how he thinks he gets respect. By being tyrannical and cruel. Stay here. Look at, or not stay here. Look at Matthew. I'm sorry. Hold on. Matthew 9.13. Let me move my camera up a little. There we go. Um, Matthew 9.13. This is about when he, Jesus was eating with the, you know, the tax collectors and sinners and they're like why is he eating with sinners and he says you know this is what he says he says go learn what this means i love that go away go away and learn what this means look i will have mercy and not sacrifice for i am not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance hallelujah it's like people that go to church and they're tithing Okay, or, or, you know, how Catholics are going and they're doing their stupid mass and they're bowing to Mary and they're doing just stupid things. Okay, God doesn't want sacrifice until your heart is in it first. Those who have their heart in it first, those are the ones that have mercy. Those are the ones that need God's mercy and those are the ones that show other people mercy. Again, Mercy doesn't mean tolerance that you accept sin and tolerate it. Mercy is holy living. Okay? 
the righteous are merciful. Amen. And look, he calls them to repentance. You know what that means? Repenting from willful sin. Changing your mind. Doing a 180 in your life. Amen. Mercy is the spiritual clothing of a true convert. Look at look at Colossians 3:12. Put on therefore, look, put on, okay? When you, you're putting on the new man. So when you're born again, you're taking off who you used to be. It's like spiritual clothes. You're taking off your wretchedness and you're now putting on Christ as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Look, holy, holy. That's the whole point of being a Christian, living holy and then what happens after that you will have balls of mercies this this is an inner inner core that happens to the true convert that has put on christ they will have pity and compassion kindness humbleness of mind meekness that means soft tempered long suffering that means endures like negative situations without complaining Forbearing one another, restraining your wrath from one another. Here we go. Forgiving one another. Even as Christ forgave you, you also need to do. You can't forgive other people. Well, then God can't forgive you. How do you expect God to forgive you all your sins in your life when you can't, you can't forgive one little petty thing that someone did to you? It's petty. Unforgiveness is poison. Every person in hell right now has unforgiveness. They have pride. Okay? They're, they were cruel. They didn't get it. Okay? Because they didn't have love. That's the bond in 14. They didn't have love. You can't have the bond of perfection until you have the perfect righteousness of Christ. Hallelujah. Preaching. Look at Micah 6, 8. Minor prophet. He has showed you, O oh man... What is good? And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly and to what? Love mercy. And to walk humbly with the God. With your God. God shows us what is good. How? Well, by his word. Number one. When you know God's word, you're supposed to live God's word. Don't be like the devil where you're learning all this knowledge and you're not putting it to use in your life. Those who put the Bible to use are being taught what is good. And what does the Lord require for you? Well, to love mercy. That's what. Those are the ones that are humble. And they do what is right. Amen. Only the humble have mercy. And it is only because of God's mercy we are now all consumed. Look at uh, Lamentations after Jeremiah. Lamentations was written by Jeremiah. It means sorrow. He's, that's why he's the weeping prophet. Um, 3.22. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassion fails not. Look at that. Do you know why God doesn't just say, forget everyone and blow this whole world to pieces? Because he's merciful. He has compassion. This is a well-known verse. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Amen. Faithful to what? His word. 
okay? God is going to do what he said he's going to do. And because of that, he has mercy and compassion. That's why he doesn't destroy Israel. The Jews are not going to get saved because they deserved it. None of us deserved salvation. He saves them to show that he's a merciful and compassionate God who is faithful to his word. Hallelujah. Amen. Those faithful have mercy. Isn't that interesting? So basically, if you have no faith, no saving faith, those are the ones who have no mercy. You'll know them by their fruit. And those who refuse to know and learn God's mercy will indeed have, in 17, troubled flesh in hellfire for eternity. 18. The wicked works a deceitful work, but to him that sows righteousness shall be a sure reward. When one in 18 works with deception, I'm sorry, what word am I looking for? Yeah, deception. When one works with deception and dishonesty is the evidence of wickedness. Deceived people think worldly stuff will bring contentment. But I find the ones that hoard to be most miserable of all. A deceitful worker, in 18, has no eternal profit. These people will also hustle and, and lie through life to gain riches. They sow only what will perish. It's a rotten seed in rotten soil and they think they're gonna and the only thing that comes up is rotten fruit okay but the one in 18 the one who sows righteousness will have a sure reward you see life is like farming you reap what you sow that's very biblical you you have rotten fruit with rotten seed, or you have good fruit with good seed. There's no in between. It's not rocket science to use proper judgment to know what seed people are working with. Only the good fruit connected to the vine will have eternal, they will receive eternal rewards. Look at Hosea 10, 12, Minor Prophet. So to yourself, so to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. Is that amazing? When you're sowing righteousness, you're reaping in mercy. It comes hand in hand. Look, break up your fallow ground. Break up your stony heart. For it is time to seek the Lord. Amen. <laughs> I like this. More stars. Till he come and reign righteous and, and he will reign righteousness upon you. Hallelujah. But look, people plowed, but you, this is why God's wrath was coming to Israel. They only plowed wickedness. They only reaped iniquity. They even eat the fruit of lies. Well, when you believe false prophets and you're sitting in front of ministers of Satan, listening to a false gospel, it means, you're, it means that you're eating the fruit of lies because they didn't really trust in the way, God's way. Well, they, and they, oh, they only wanted to trust in the mighty men, in their, in their soldiers, in their power, in their weapons, not in God. So notice the difference. The righteous sowing reaps mercy. The wicked, when they plow, 
It's only sin that comes. You will know them from their fruit. You can only receive righteousness when God breaks up your stony heart. That happens the second you have a saving faith. And only then will one reap mercy. This doesn't happen before salvation. It happens after salvation. In what do you, in what do you with the prophet God gives you will be evidence of your heart condition, what you do with God's wealth, okay, will show your heart. Look at 2 Corinthians 9.6. But this I say, he which sows sparingly shall reap also sparingly. If you only sow a little, you're only going to receive a little. But he which sows bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Now, this has to do also not necessarily, not with exactly God providing, which it is, but this could also be harvesting field, okay? It's giving the gospel. If you're only going to give the gospel to a few, then that means only a few are going to be converted. You, you do it a lot, then you have a higher chance that the, the, it's going to be more bountiful, okay? Be careful with this verse. Because there's a lot of prosperity gospels who want to use this as sowing the seed. When you sowing the seed by taking advantage of the congregation and making the pastor wealthy. If you are in a church or you hear a pastor say this, sowing the seed for tithing. That's a prosperity gospel. They're twisting this completely out of context. Okay. God loves a cheerful giver. Yes, he does. In verse 7. Be careful who you're giving your money to. Okay. That's the whole point. Be careful who you're giving your money to. You don't necessarily need to tithe in a church. How about find a family? Okay, that needs help monthly and help with what you can give to that specific family. Okay, know where your money is going. Amen. Also, this doesn't mean on earth you're going to receive all these rewards for giving to the poor. No, not necessarily. Okay, can God provide for you? Yes. But your rewards are in heaven. Hallelujah. It's more better to give than to receive. Amen. Catholics. Back in Proverbs. And, and many other branches off, uh, off of their religion. Are spiritually in verse 18. Deceitful workers. Let's talk spiritual. They think it's their own works added to the cross for salvation. Deceived workers indeed. For salvation, understand, one comes to the cross with nothing. None of your good works, none of your merits, none of your church goings, none of your tithing, none of your Bible reading, nothing in your life that you have ever done. All you have is faith. That's it. Easy. Easy. Then after salvation is when the evidence you are saved will show by your good works. Good works does not come before salvation. It's after salvation is when your good works will show that you are saved. But Catholics think that you need good works to be saved. Anyone who's adding their own self-righteousness to the cross is going to find themselves in a fiery hell and there's no purgatory. 
Look at 2 Thessalonians 2.10. This is about the revealing of the Antichrist, but notice in the last days. Um, well, look in 10, wait, did I say 210? Yeah. Um, with all deceivableness deceived, look, of unrighteousness in them that perish. Notice, who is deceived in the last days? Those who are going to perish. This is why it's so important to read the word of God. You don't know if you're standing in front of a minister of Satan at your church. Because they received what? Not the love of the truth. They, they refused God's word. They didn't want the truth. They wanted their false religions, their stupid traditions. They didn't want to re really be saved. Okay? But they actually think they're going to heaven. That's interesting. Only those who are perishing will follow deception because the Holy Spirit is truth. And when you have the Holy Spirit, it's very, very hard to be deceived. Look, for this cause, for what cause? For them denying God's word, denying the truth. What's God do? Oh, he's going to send them a strong delusion to believe lies. Wow. That's, it. That's like the Catholic Church. Why does God allow the Catholic Church to give people who have fraud faith, okay, to separate them? You don't want the truth? Go ahead over here. Go be deceived. Go live in a strong delusion. And you're going to believe a lie because that's what you want. You refuse my word, you're going to believe a lie. Well, and if you tell a Catholic that they're in a false religion and you even give them the evidence, most likely they will reject it because they don't want the truth. That's why they're going to be damned in verse 12. I'm just reading the Bible. Really though, this has a lot to do with falling for the Antichrist. Catholicism, why do I always expose Catholicism? Well, because there's over 2 billion people who think that's the path to heaven. It needs to be exposed. Okay? Catholicism is evil deception, but unfortunately they don't know it because, like I said, they are Bible illiterate or just refuse God's word altogether. Look at Galatians 6.8. Back to sowing. For he that sows to his flesh. This is like harvest. Bringing in the harvest. Wait, wait. Let me let me rephrase this. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap correction. I mean corruption. If you're sowing to your flesh, giving in to your flesh, you're only going to reap corruption. That means destruction. But he that sows to the spirit, shall the spirit reap life everlasting. Well, that's good. Are you giving into the flesh? Well, you're going to reap destruction. Because a true born again Christian is not walking in the flesh. They're walking in the spirit. And when you walk in the spirit, you're reaping life. Amen. I find many who, who know Catholicism is not true will still give excuses for it and, and live in compromise. Why do they do this? This is what I found out. Because they had parents or grandparents who died in that false religion. So it's easier to be in denial than to think they may not even be in heaven. So what they do is they make a bridge from Catholicism to heaven. If one is truly born again, 
How on earth could they ever step into a harlot church ever again unless it's to rebuke it and pull people out? You're going to pay me a million dollars to step in any Catholic church or one that branched off of it. You know why? Because I fear the Lord and you should too. Verse 19. As righteousness tends to life, so he that pursues evil pursues it to his own death. Just as the sun rises in the east, the righteous are on the sure path path to life. Amen. One is spiritually dead if they are trying to earn eternal life with their own self-righteousness. It's only the righteousness of Christ that makes us acceptable for eternal life. You see, this world is so backwards because the majority, they will call Christians true Christians. They will call true Christians self-righteous. But we couldn't be far, we couldn't be more far from that. Because we knew our own righteousness could never be enough. And that we needed us, we needed Jesus, his perfect righteousness as our Savior and Redeemer. We knew our righteousness was not enough. That is the opposite of self-righteous. You see, they are the self-righteous ones. They are hypocrites. They're accusing true Christians of something that they are. They try to make you feel bad that you want to live holy for the Lord. Because your holiness in serving Christ makes it gives them a conviction because it proves that they are not saved. So they will try to make you feel bad for serving Christ. The Christian will be seen by the Father in heaven to have his son's perfect works. None of their own works was needed for salvation. Those who are working on their own works, trying to get to heaven, the Father's going to look at that and say, depart, I never knew you. Again, works does not come for salvation. It comes after. The others, okay, well, they don't, the others will have their own righteous works, which are not perfect, Okay. And, and they instead will be their, so what's going to happen is now they're their own sacrifice. Because they refuse the perfect sacrifice on the cross to receive Jesus' righteousness. So since they're not working with their own righteousness, it's not good enough. So now they become the sacrifice. And since they are not perfect... They must be sacrificed continually for eternity. If that offends you, then the Holy God of Israel offends you. Look at 19. They pursued, that means went after evil. And that only pursued, that means went after their own death. They pursued evil, which means they're just only, only pursuing their own death. They loved the willful sin they kept going after. And the worker of iniquity will be departed from God for eternity. Only a deceived person would think they can enter heaven while pursuing or going back to evil. 19. A willful sinner doesn't fear the Lord. Stay here. Look at 19.23. The fear of the Lord tends, that means brings to life. And he that hates it 
shall abide satisfied. That means be relaxed. He shall not be visited with evil. I'm sorry, he that has it, not hates it. He that has eternal life are the ones that fear the Lord. They're the ones that are relaxed. They have a clear conscience. They're satisfied. They're not going to be visited with evil. Okay? What's that? That's destruction. You're not going to be destroyed. You're going to receive eternal life. Hallelujah. Those who go back to willful sin, they don't fear the Lord. Twenty. But that, I'm sorry, they that are of a froward heart are abomination to the Lord. But such as are upright in their way are his delight. And 20. When people say God is love, love, love. Forget he is, well, holy, holy, holy. And there are people who are in abomination to him in verse 20. Specifically here, ones with a froward heart. He hates them. I didn't write the Bible. Forward heart. These are hypocrites whose lying hearts are not really sincere to God. Lukewarm. God hates those who pretend to love him. This is why the lukewarm receive a harsher penalty than an atheist. At least an atheist doesn't play the hypocrite and pretend to love him. Revelation 3.15 and 16. I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold because you are lukewarm. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Notice the words in that. I'd rather you be hot. That means on fire. Born again. Or cold. I'd rather you be an atheist than to pretend that you love me. Those that pretend to love God are going to receive a harsher penalty than an atheist. These great pretenders might fool people, but they don't fool God. They try to appear holy with their speech, but inside they are a dead tomb. With proper discernment and righteous judgment, you can detect the rotten fruit from these great pretenders. For one, they will scream their famous motto that they love to say, don't judge. This, be, this is because if you do, they will be found out as, as a fraud. They don't want you to know that they're frauds, that they're lukewarm, that their love for God is a lie. But if you judge righteously, you'll be able to discern this. That's why they don't want you using any proper judgment at all. In 20... But those upright, that means honest, in their way, in their way, that means with their love for God and on his path are God's delight. Another word for upright is blameless, which means, which means they are living in no willful sin, blameless. Blameless also means undefiled. Look at Psalms 119, verse 1. Oh, I like that. The first, let me see. Yeah, the first, uh, oh, 119, that's the alphabet. Yep, this is the Hebrew alphabet, if you'll notice. It's the 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Each one, each one starts with, um, the Hebrew alphabet, and then you can go and you can actually see what they mean. Like for instance, for example, a leaf here in 119, that means master in chief. All right. That that's basically the letter A and that's what it looks like. Okay. And then it goes B, 
Beth, that means house. That's why they call it Bethel, the house of God, okay? So it's quite interesting. You should go through and try and find the definitions of these and write them underneath it. It's interesting. Anyways, 119 verse 1, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Undefiled. This is another word. Some, in, some translations will say the upright. Those are the ones who walk in the law of the Lord. They're not going back to willful sin. Okay. Look in three. They do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Well, you can't do that when you're going back. Are you walking with the Lord or are you walking back into old sin? You'll know them by their fruit. The upright. These are people, these people have been forgiven and with their love and gratitude for Jesus, they would never do anything on purpose to offend him. Not on purpose. No way. That's the one God delights in. In, in verse 20. Look, those are his delight. Those who don't offend him on purpose. Those who love him and they're sincere about it. The one that God delights in is because they depend on his strength alone as he gives them a way out of every daily temptation. That's walking in his way. There is no in-between ground. You either are an abomination to God or you're his delight. If you're not born again, working with the righteousness of Christ, you're an abomination to the Lord. But if you're born again, you're a Christian, you repented from willful sin, you're living holy, leading people to Christ, then you're his delight. Because he can use you. You're serving him. He's a king. Amen. It's terrifying to know how many are God's enemy. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for your son paying for the, the Christian's sin debt. And because of our gratitude, we are in debt to now serve you for eternity. We are a spiritual sacrifice and now glorify you every second of the day. You honor, I'm sorry, every second of the day, we are to honor you. I pray more forgive and let the past go. Only then will they be at peace with you and themselves. There are over 2 billion deceitful workers in Catholicism who are trying to merit their way to heaven. They and other lukewarms have a forward heart that you hate because their love for you is fraud and religious. You want all of our heart. You want the simplicity of the Bible, just a relationship. I pray more become the upright and blameless in your sight because of your son's righteousness alone that was given as a free gift. It's nothing we deserved, but you are a merciful God. And we are to be merciful if we follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.